Great. So we're going live. Hi and welcome everybody. Today we have Dushan Davesa with us. He is uh, one of the most eminent senior advocates at the Supreme Court, former president of Supreme Court Bar Association. He doesn't need much introduction. Okay. So I'm going to move directly. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for joining in. And we have we've gone live on YouTube also. And I'm really, really glad that you're here with us, sir. And our topic today is on uh, limits on the right to freedom of speech and expression in light of Supreme Court judgments, uh, which recent Supreme Court judgments. Sir, so, uh, sir, uh, I'm going to hand over the podium to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Abhishek, and all your colleagues for uh, inviting me uh, on this platform. It's my pleasure and privilege to be with you. And uh, I intend... Uh, to uh, you know, treat this uh, conversation with uh, all of you. I see 240 friends have joined. Uh, I intend to perhaps uh, give a greater platform uh, to all of you to uh, you know, speak to me rather than I speak to you because more often than not, as you know, all senior lawyers love to talk a lot. And when they get a platform or a mic, they end up uh, speaking much more than what they should. And that's the experience that you see in the Supreme Court also. But anyway, having said that, we have today a very interesting subject <coughs> that you have chosen, and that is limits on freedom of speech and expression in the light of Supreme Court judgments. Now, it's very difficult to you know, define the limits. Uh, well, uh, the freedom of speech and expression, which is guaranteed to us under Article 19.1a, uh, is not absolute. As all of you know, that uh, by virtue of Article 19.2, uh, there can be a law which, uh, you know, puts reasonable restrictions on that freedom, uh, uh, you know, on uh, various grounds, uh, whether it is on the ground of uh, in sovereignty or integrity of India, security of state, friendly relations with foreign states, public order, decency, morality, contempt of court, defamation and incitement to an offense, uh, you know, uh, sedition, for example. Now, unfortunately, what seems to have happened is that over the years, while you know, the Supreme Court has been interpreting the uh, right as broadly as possible, uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, the right under Article 21, right of personal liberty, also takes into its sweep all these rights under Article 19, uh, because you know, personal liberty uh, is a very, very wide definition. And uh, therefore, you have liberty, even if uh, you know, uh, this was uh, not expressly provided. In fact, Justice H.R. Khanna's judgment in the famous ADM Jabalpur's case, uh, dissenting, very, very powerful judgment. And I recommend that those who have not read it must uh, you know, read that powerful dissent. He put it very beautifully. He said that these rights are not you know, uh, uh, important just because they have been declared to be fundamental rights under the constitution. But these are you know, very important essential human rights. And therefore, these rights have come from time immemorial. And those rights, therefore, you know, must inure to the benefit of every citizen of the country. So he, you know, took it even on a, you know, philosophical platform to say that uh, even if the constitution had not provided these as fundamental rights or recognized them as fundamental rights, these are essential human rights. And therefore, you know, every citizen has these rights. Now, subject, of course, to the restrictions, etc. Now, over the years, you know, we all know what has happened. The law declared by the Supreme Court is uh, on, uh, I would say, uh, merely in the judgments. Uh, no government really uh, cares or bothers about the judgments of the Supreme Court now. And, uh, you know, all kinds of restrictions are being imposed. All kinds of actions are being taken. Uh, and uh, therefore, people's rights are being seriously curtailed uh, so far as freedom of speech and expression is concerned. There is a very beautiful statement by uh, late Kanayal Al Munshi in the Constituent Assembly debate. He was one of the finest uh, you know, members of the Assembly, a great literary figure who set up uh, Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan, one of the finest authors in Gujarati literature. His books are absolute classic, uh, you know, uh, Patanni Prabhuta and other uh, books absolutely unbelievable uh, quality of literature. Uh, great educationist, great freedom fighter, and a great lawyer. Kanayal Al-Munshi put it in one sentence. 
and he said essence of democracy is in criticism of government now this tells us uh, you know especially in today's context where everybody is you know sought to be uh, proceeded against by the government for you know criticism uh, it's really uh, it's something which we have to understand that on the one hand there is a constitutional right a fundamental right and you know very few uh, judgments have really proceeded on this aspect but there is something which we must notice that article 13 which recognizes fundamental rights categorically provides that any law any notification any order or any governmental action which is in violation of this fundamental right is void ab initio now this is something which has not been really expanded so far by the courts uh, you know except in passing and this is the essence that if it is void ab initio any action then you know what is the sequestrator why is it that the courts are unable to really you know enforce this uh, guarantee uh, to the citizens as broadly as possible as widely as possible and uh, as beneficial as possible to the citizens because ultimately <coughs> we must realize i mean nobody can say that uh, you have an absolute right to hurt somebody's sentiments or insult somebody or you know uh, 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 defame somebody or hurt somebody's religious feelings that's not the but how far to what extent uh, we can go there is no limit prescribed anywhere now what is a reasonable restriction is also a very vague term now more often than not the reasonable restriction has been a subjective satisfaction of the executive and this is where the constitutional framers were very very clear that the guarantees are not only substantive but also procedural now if they are both substantive and procedural guarantees against invasion by the state then the state cannot really interfere with the right uh, at its discretion at its absolute discretion and particularly at its subjective discretion there must be objective criteria and this is where the debate is now becoming i would say more and more narrow with the passage of time especially in last 6 years where we are finding that the you know the expression or uh, the right is being slowly and slowly curtailed uh, for no reason whatsoever so i mean it began with 2014 when somebody simply uh, you know made a comment against prime minister modi on uh, his facebook or something and they were arrested some young people including some young women and uh, they were put to jail Uh, now this kind of a thing which is happening in this country is a complete aberration of the actual legal and constitutional position it is completely contrary to the supreme court judgment and this is where you know uh, the conflict is beginning uh, if a if a comedian or a stand up uh, you know artist makes some comment about it uh, then i think uh, you know suddenly he will find that an fir is lodged in some corner of the country and he will be arrested now if this is the kind of a the kind of a uh, you know uh, approach to uh, fundamental rights then i think i can definitely say that we are not safe and we therefore need to understand what is the scope and ambit of our right you know if if this is how they are going to interpret the government today then perhaps almost on a every second day late rk uh, lakshman would have faced with fires because his cartoons were absolutely brilliant you know if you saw times of india in the 60s and 70s and 80s his cartoons really tore apart the governments of the day on daily issues and he was absolutely brilliant in his uh, uh, and yet uh, no government ever you know dared to proceed against him because you know there is a there is a freedom which must be understood because in in humor uh, you know in satire in cartoon uh, a message is being conveyed a message which is a kind of a freedom of speech and expression to criticize the government to tell the government that what you are doing is not right or what is happening is really you know not uh, proper now that level of tolerance therefore has seriously decreased since 2014 now what therefore are the limits today according to me it is impossible to describe when you will face 
you know, a FIR uh, merely because you have spoken out uh, as part of your fundamental right of freedom of speech and expression against the government. Take, for example, the present controversy uh, on uh, Amazon uh, serial. Now, I have not seen the serial, but I would certainly say that nobody, no producer, no director, no script writer, and no actor would ever like to hurt the sentiments of any other community. Sometimes when you are trying to make a serial or a film, you are doing it to convey a particular message. And, you know, in every religion, there are certain, you know, uh, there are many good points, but there are certain shortcomings. And it is therefore important to bring those shortcomings out. And if you are going to, you know, say that because you have pointed out the shortcomings in a particular religion, that itself amounts to, you know, a criminal offense, uh, it's really to uh, say, uh, I think it, it's really to curb the right. Now, having said that, let me tell you one thing. <laughs> that Supreme Court said it very beautifully in Manubai Shah's case. And the last part of the judgment, the Supreme Court puts it brilliantly. It says, efforts by intolerant authorities to curb or suffocate this freedom have always been firmly repelled, more so when public authorities have betrayed autocratic tendencies. Now, this is what the Supreme Court had said in Manubai Shah's case when it interpreted freedom of speech in an extremely wide way manner in 1992. And it's one of the most beautiful judgments uh, uh, that was delivered by <coughs> Justices Amadi and Justice Punchi. He said, and they said, I will quote it, the words freedom of speech and expression must therefore be broadly construed to include the freedom to circulate one's views by words of mouth or in writing or through audiovisual instrumentalities. It therefore includes the right to pro propagate one's views through the uh, print media or through any other communication channel like radio or television. Every citizen in the country therefore has a right to air his or her views through printing and electronic media, subject of course to permissible restrictions under 19.2. Now this, uh, you know, uh, in fact, I must tell you one thing that during the constituent assembly debate, some of the members had expressed that on the one hand, you are giving right under 19.1 and on the other, you are taking away that right by bringing 19.2. Because in the garb of reasonable restriction, the executive of the day will do anything to bring kind of a law and order or a notification or, uh, you know, any instruction to curb that right. But then, you know, the great Sardar Patel, one of our India's greatest, uh, you know, sons, he was chairing the Fundamental Rights Committee. <clears throat> and he broadly brought uh, these rights and he says in his uh, uh, in his uh, speech to the constituent assembly when he presented his report that the, the 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 committee on fundamental rights had seen every constitution of the world had seen it from all perspectives and then decided to bring this uh, you know fundamental rights into the constitution and when they gave that he said something very, very, very important, which unfortunately even Supreme Court today has forgotten. He said that while giving these rights, we are giving you a very, very efficacious remedy by way of Article 32. Because, and that we are giving you as a fundamental right itself. 32 is part of fundamental rights chapter. So we are not only giving you fundamental right of freedom of speech or expression or peaceable assembly or right to move or right to carry on trade, et cetera, et cetera. But we are giving you 32 because as Ambedkar said, you know, in his opening remarks in the constituent assembly, that rights without remedy is useless. So 32 was created specifically. Today, more often than not, Supreme Court doesn't even understand the import of this power that has been conferred upon them. I would say duty conferred upon the Supreme Court to really ensure that fundamental rights are protected to the hilt. And Supreme Court more often than not drives citizens to the various high courts and says, you go and agitate your you know, grievances there, which is wrong. Because if my fundamental right is violated, I have a right to move the Supreme Court and Supreme Court has a duty to, you know, if it finds that it is violated, Supreme Court must step in. It can't say go to high court. That's, and Sardar Patel said that one of the things that we have provided in this, therefore, is this kind of a, you know, protection of the rights through 32. <coughs> now that, you know, this is where I think today, 
there is a very serious uh, debate which is required in our country as to the real ambit of this you know right the real you know ambit of this remedy and how far we can reconcile this right uh, with the reasonable restrictions and how far these reasonable restrictions can be tested by the supreme court now this is something which we needs a very very serious debate today in the country and uh, you know uh, uh, it's becoming now increasingly difficult because i will tell you that uh, 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 i mean one of the things which has troubled me the most and which we are seeing that while you and i as citizens were or a comedian or you know a film maker are being proceeded against people who grossly violated this you know freedom for example while reporting the uh, nizamuddin markaz uh, incidents uh, which was nothing frankly you know this group of people had gathered there with permission from the government and suddenly lockdown was brought trains buses and planes were not working 144 was imposed they couldn't have left their place and yet they were raided for police by police for no reason <coughs> somebody had the covid because there were 300 foreigners i mean i'm sure uh, there were as many people who had covid when uh, trump's meeting took place in ahmedabad in february much late uh, you know just about the same time uh, but these people were raided and uh, fires were filed they were arrested but the media both section of print media and electronic media virtually called them you know walking bombs and virtually demonized the whole community and you know really as a result of that there was a very serious social outcry against them where in villages people refused to take uh, you know supplies from their shops etc etc now this was really un uh, undesirable and it should have been proceeded against because there are enough powers with the government to shut down these kind of you know provocative uh, 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 television coverage or print media coverage but government didn't do anything because it suited the government to really demonize a particular community now this is something which is very troublesome today in the country that <coughs> on the one hand you don't want to take any action take for example delhi riots where the statements of certain you know political leaders belonging to the ruling party were extremely provocative extremely and one in fact a sitting minister almost went to the extent of saying mar do logon ko now yet no action has been taken against them and we are saying today that action is being taken against anybody who is publicly a dissenter against the government now this is something which is an extraordinary situation developing in the country that do we want a country where our right to criticize the government our right to speak against the policies or actions of the government is curtailed because of <coughs> on political lines it is curtailed on subjective satisfaction of the authorities because we know today that the police across the country and this has been happening not today under the present regime it happened even during the congress regime the police simply does not act independently and as a result of that the police is willing to you know strike at the opponents of the government and you know shelter all those who are supported by the government the difficulty arises this and this is where we really need the judiciary to wake up there is a tremendous responsibility on judiciary to guard these rights tremendous responsibility and that is at the level of the magistrate to the supreme court now every magistrate or a sessions judge under the criminal procedure court has power when the case comes to him to ensure that there is proper investigation and if there is improper investigation then to direct the police to reinvestigate the case <coughs> <coughs> what do we find today we find that the judiciary at virtually every level is not willing to apply its mind on the right principles that you know of the constitution our constitutional framers have given us these rights to keeping in mind certain principles keeping in mind really this aspect that rule of law maintenance of the constitutional principles and constitutional morality are fundamental to survival of a good a vibrant democracy now that democracy if it is going to be undermined because of failure on the part of the police and the judiciary then i can dare say that nobody is going to be safe in the country and this is what is troublesome today 
this is where all of us especially the young generation like yours have to really think as to what can be done about it what should be done about it and one way of doing it is to have as many debates as possible write as many articles as possible to point out to the judges that what you are doing is not right judge is not expected to be biased he has to be free from all kinds of biases political bias religious bias cultural bias caste bias every kind of a bias the judge is supposed to be free from so when the judge sees that you know certain actions are i mean certain charges are being brought by the police against certain individuals who merely happen to be the opponents of the government the judge has to test them and tell the police that this is not enough you can't just proceed against people merely because they have criticized the government so uh, this is now becoming you know something which is very very <coughs> i would say uh, very very <coughs> <clears throat> very very <clears throat> uh, unfortunate turn of events which was avoidable because we still love our judiciary we still love uh, respect our courts and we want to continue to respect our judges and our courts and that's the last hope for citizens because you know uh, political power when it has the majority and this is where ambedkar had very categorically warned that will india lose democracy somebody asked him a question and he said yes india may lose democracy if there is a landslide it will re retain democracy in form but will lose it in fact he said now this is a very profound statement made by dr ambedkar in 1948 we are in 2021 and we are seeing today that simply because a particular party has a majority and it's not just confined to bjp mrs gandhi with that kind of a majority imposed emergency on upon us and took away our fundamental rights so we have to understand that all political parties and political leaders somehow want to perpetuate power and as was said thousands of years ago power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely they want absolute power they want absolute power and for them fundamental rights don't mean a damn thing now the real you know real bulwark against that kind of invasion was judiciary but i mean today's judiciary i must say that there is it's been extremely disappointing extremely disappointing in fact this case that i talked about uh, uh, this nizamuddin markaz case the jamaat ulama hind uh, has filed a writ petition in uh, supreme court writ petition 787 of 2020 it's being heard before the honorable chief justice uh, for last about 7 months i myself had appeared in four or five hearings and i must say with great uh, you know disappointment that the supreme court did not uh, tick off the government to take action against this airing television channels or print media and it's just giving yes today's newspaper also you would have seen the honorable chief justice did remark that this is all wrong and you must have power but the existing powers are not being exercised and the court is not even at all uh, telling that you please exercise the existing power now if any other channel like ndtv had done that they would have you know uh, removed them from air for 48 hours or 72 hours but because these channels support the government like republic and times now they or z television they won't do it and this is where there is a serious you know uh, i would say uh, serious uh, uh, failure on the part of the judiciary we expect judiciary to act swiftly fiercely independently it doesn't happen it's not happening and you know the reason is simply this that the judiciary took away the power from the government to appoint supreme court and high court judges i have repeatedly said this in 1992 the second judges judgment case the foundation of you know that when they interpreted article 124 to mean that instead of the word consultation it must be concurrence of the chief justice so they said unless chief justice concurs the president can't appoint a high court or supreme court judge or transfer him then they brought out this you know uh, uh, very funny mechanism called collegium to appoint these kind of judges now but be that as it may the very foundation of that power or that you know i would say grabbing of that power by judiciary from the executive was that fiercely independent judges free from political 
or economic control will be appointed to these high positions. And one of the most beautiful aspect of that judgment is that we will now henceforward <clears throat> select best from those amongst available. Now that's not happening. All appointments are happening are really, I would say, uh, far from satisfactory. And as a result, the Supreme Court has become weaker and weaker since 1992. You look at the judgments of the Supreme Court in the 50s, 60s and 70s or even late 80s, you will find that judges really meant to protect citizens' fundamental rights. You now find judges are unable to protect them. And more often than not, the judges are taking views which are you know, in tune with their personal philosophies, which is not what should happen. So uh, it's uh, you know, the erosion of this judicial power to control the executive, to control the parliament is seriously now undermining our fundamental rights. So while we have rights under the constitution, those rights are, I think, now re increasingly remaining only on paper. We are unable to really enjoy those rights in the manner in which the constitutional framers wanted us to enjoy. And this is where I will read one particular statement of Professor K.T. Shah during the Constituent Assembly debate on 1st of December 1948, when they were discussing fundamental rights chapter. <coughs> he said, the liber liberty of person to fight against any arbitrary arrest or detention without due process has been the basis of English constitutional growth and the French constitution that was born out of re revolution. The autocrat, the despot, has always wished, whenever he was bankrupt of any other argument, just to shut up those who did not agree with him. Please see this you know, profound statement. The autocrat, the despot, has always wished, whenever he was bankrupt of any other argument, just to shut up those who did not agree with him. It was therefore that any time the slighted difference of opinion was expressed, the slighted, slightest inconvenience or embarrassment was likely to be caused by an individual. The only course open to those who wanted to exercise autocratic power was to imprison or arrest or detain such a person without charge or trial. Now that's precisely what is happening and that's not good. People are being kept in jail for no reason for expression for speech, for movement, and judges are not releasing them on bail, though they should be released. Ultimate trials, 99% of these people who are being charged like this will be released if they are free and fair trials. But they would have spent anywhere between six months to several years in jails so that they can be shut up. Now, this is not the kind of a country which our constitutional framers had envisaged. They wanted a you know, country where the ideas were always free to be expressed. Now, this is something which we really must be, uh, there's a you know, recent judgment, for example, in ODC communication, 88 judgment, the Supreme Court very beautifully said that freedom of expression is a preferred right, which is always very jealously guarded by this court. Now, the preferred right, and jealously guarded by the court. We all know what's happening, what the court must is doing today. So it's, it's, it's something which we must understand. We all know that there is a right. We all know that there is a constitution which protects that right. We all know that there is Supreme Court under 32, which is supposed to enforce that right, but it's not happening. So frankly, are there limits to my mind? There are no limitations when it comes to, you know, criticizing the government. There are no limitations unless, of course, you are going to incite violence or incite mutiny or you are going to defame somebody. Power of contempt is something which is really ridiculous in this, uh, you know, day and age because, uh, you know, uh, more often than not, judges have misbehaved. Uh, so openly that we as citizens have an absolute right, according to me, to criticize those judges' conduct. I mean, if a chief justice of the Supreme Court, Chief Justice Gogoi, was involved in a sexual harassment charge leveled by a class three employee of the Supreme Court, then I think we all have a right to you know, take upon the chief justice and criticize him as much as we can. 
because no country in the world would have tolerated such a behavior of a chief justice it's all right you know we still treat our women as second rate citizens and do not trust their statements which is sad we have seen these two judgments recently by this just judge pushpa from nagpur bench where she has interpreted the law so perversely that i would say that she should be sacked from judiciary she should be sacked from judiciary she should be impeached for those judgments because you can't you know interpret judgments in this fashion where women especially young children are going to be you know treated in this fashion and 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 men can just get away by doing anything and you are going to say that these are not you know criminal assaults and reduce the sentences of the men what kind of perversion of mind is that are we living in some antiquated era we are today living in an era where men and women are equal you have to respect the rights of the women and especially children these are kids so i feel that what has happened is is really the mindset of the of the judiciary uh, which is very uh, deep and pervasive it's not confined to a few judges it is happening all around in fact uh, uh, one of the other judges of the senior judges of the bombay high court again a lady uh, she is now retired she she gave a bail to certain you know a, a hindu a boys who had killed the like, muslim boy by recording recording in her order that yes the murderers were there yes they were apprehended on the site yes their blood stained clothes were found yes their weapons were found yes their uh, 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 scooters were found yes yes there were two witnesses including a head constable but i give bail because the victim was from the minority community now is this the kind of a judiciary we should be proud of the supreme court set it aside Uh, chief justice bobde himself wrote that uh, opinion and said and warned that judges should not do this in a country like ours where you know the secular fiber is very strong but the fact that a senior high court judge could write an opinion like this and give bail that shows that what is happening in judiciary is not really healthy and this is only happening after 1992 when judges have started appointing judges so it's it's something which is uh, which really is extraordinarily troublesome to my mind uh, we need a very serious uh, rethinking about uh, this uh, situation uh, to my mind whatever supreme court judgments are being written <clears throat> they are law of the land by virtue of article 141 and by virtue of article 144 every civil and judicial authority is bound to act in aid of the supreme court but they are merely on paper nobody is willing to follow them and judges themselves don't follow them the judges themselves don't ensure the enforcement of those that good law the 50s and 60s have interpreted you know these fundamental rights so beautifully but but uh, it's not being enforced so why blame the executive alone we must blame also the uh, the judiciary for not being able to stand up which stand this kind of uh, you know inroad inroad into their power the erosion of their own power by the executive yeah i mean so this is where we really need to now introspect seriously look at it contrasted to this to united states of america or england for example uh, you know you i don't know whether you saw or not but last year the british supreme court gave a fantastic judgment when prime minister boris johnson refused to summon the parliament and the supreme court said nothing doing we direct you to summon the parliament now imagine in our country is it ever conceivable that our supreme court would do that in united states look at the situation i mean the appointees of the trump three appointees of trump out of nine justices on the bench but all unanimously said nothing doing your charges of election fraud are absolutely wrong we are not going to interfere with the matter in united states the media was you know attacking trump the silicon valley was attacking trump the uh, business community was attacking hollywood was attacking trump so you know although the country is thoroughly polarized as we saw the attack on capitol hill but yet people were willing to stand up and this is where india really has to now we are the largest democracy in the world 
and we cannot preserve our democracy if you are going to accept anything and everything lying down we need to understand our rights we need to talk to people about their rights we need to ensure that these rights are respected and protected as much as possible and unless we do that i can assure you all that we are in very very serious difficulty there may not be a proclaimed emergency today but there is certainly a very very difficult situation today where the person who at you know this attack on 26 january on red fort which is the symbol of democracy the most pious symbol of democracy is red fort where right from 15th august 1947 our national flag has been unfurled <coughs> if that symbol of democracy was defied defied by somebody who is now known and is in hiding and they can't catch him while they are trying to run after the other farm leaders who had nothing to do with it who shunned violence for 62 days who said we are not party to it so here comes somebody from somewhere to disrupt the movement and yet the cbi and the other agencies are not able to catch him and so what is what do we make out of all this we we really must therefore as as responsible citizens nobody says you know we all must have our political views nothing wrong about it we may agree with a party or a b party but as citizens we should be united in one thing we should all love constitution of india in the same breadth with the same intensity if we do not love constitution of india with the same intensity then i think democracy is in peril and that's not what we want so and we have huge challenges as a nation huge challenges we can only do it if there is unity if there is no unity then these challenges cannot be fought so i would respectfully submit that i mean forget what the supreme court has said because to my mind the law declared by the supreme court is being i think ignored by the executive and parliament on a virtually daily basis Uh, what we really need to understand is that we have a right and that freedom of speech and expression is absolute except to the extent as provided in 192 that there must be law which says that you know uh, yeah, and that law must put reasonable restriction unless those restrictions are reasonable and reasonable both in substantive and procedural manner we 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 have you know right to speak uh, whatever we like and i don't think the uh, the government uh, has any right to control uh, our freedom in any manner so that's what i would respectfully urge all of you to think and follow and ensure that constitution is now worshiped like a bible or a geeta or a quran or a guru granth sahib and that constitution is really expanded so that people can really live in a free atmosphere and people can develop their personalities as freely as possible if governments think that criticism small criticism here or there or even a large protest by farmers is going to uh, you know shake up the foundation of democracy then i think the governments are wrong in fact the democracies will be strengthened with every statement of criticism every protest and every moment uh, because you know they, 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 these expressions are only to really guide our leaders in the right path the constitutional path the rule of law path and that's it so i i think that uh, uh, we really have a great future the future is in your hands the young people and let us hope uh, how far uh, we can carry this forward thank you very very much thank you so much sir uh, i have got a lot of questions from uh, the participants i am going i have shortlisted some of them i'm afraid i will not be able to take all we will run past 3 sir uh but i'm going to ask a few questions sir which the participants have shared uh one question is sir on the farm law protest can the court only declare that a particular law is unconstitutional or does it not have the power to make a committee for a law as done in farm laws well i think uh, the court uh, it's not no part of court's function to appoint these kind of committees honestly and uh, i think uh, the supreme court has definitely Uh, made a mistake in constituting a committee because the laws have been passed by the parliament the government has state firstly refused to you know withdraw the laws in uh, 11 or 12 rounds of discussions with the farmers 
the farmers are insisting that the laws should be repealed in those circumstances in a political uh, you know uh, area the court should not have stepped in in fact court has itself warned in the past that we should not step into political arena the court has stepped in perhaps the court was doing it to you know give a ruse to the farmers to pacify them but that's not part of court's function i think it was uh, beyond the court's constitutional uh, functions to do what it did and i must say that i am disappointed with it thank you sir so one more question was from a participant that if the supreme court says that you can go back to the high court and the supreme court is flooded with work and gives an opportunity that come back to us if the high court does not address your issue so so what is practically wrong with that is that's what the participant asked well the power under 32 and power under 226 in somewhat way are concurrent no doubt about it. but 32 is a fundamental right 226 is not a fundamental right therefore right to move the supreme court being a fundamental right supreme court can't shun that you know and say that you go to the high courts i personally feel i mean if they are flooded they are flooded because of their own problems they are not flooded because of citizens problems the biggest problem with the supreme court today is that supreme court is not willing to take anybody's advice to for case management the supreme court should constitute experts to advise the supreme court as to how it can reduce the burden and one of the reasons for example this lockdown entire country is now working the supreme court is still wanting to function on virtual basis i, I mean they are afraid hundreds of policemen in the country have died hundreds of safai karmacharis have died hundreds of doctors and nurses have died fighting covid but they are not running away from their responsibility so i don't understand why judiciary should say that we will have virtual hearings and not physical hearing of course you must regulate you must ensure that people's you know safety is uh, maintained but and as a result of that there has been serious uh, you know i would say the functioning is far from satisfactory we have lost almost a year without doing substantive work so i think supreme court can't just you know for its own failures say that you go to the high court i know i don't agree with it if there is a clear cut violation of fundamental right brought to the supreme court's notice the court has a duty all that the court has to do is to intervene and grant a stay where is the problem it's a matter of half an hour 15 minutes so i i don't agree with the approach of the court that you should pe uh, drive people away even in habeas corpus the supreme court drives away people i i'll tell you a classic example of the president of the jammu and kashmir bar association who my defended in supreme court he his habeas corpus petition was uh, uh, took almost a uh, nine months in high court nine months and when we came to the supreme court supreme court pleaded with the government not to extend his period and ultimately he was released a day or two before his 12 month period was to expire now there was no material against him the charges against him were 10 years old for which criminal cases were pending it could never have been basis of preventive detention now <clears throat> if this happens to president of the bar association then you can imagine what would happen to an ordinary citizen so i i i feel that supreme court itself has said that we are the guardians of the constitution we are the guardians of the fundamental rights of the citizen if you are the guardian angel then you must behave like one you can't shun away responsibility so one of thank you so much sir so one of the participants has asked that how do we raise awareness and write articles without inviting cont uh, contempt of court eminent lawyers are convicted for a few tweets and sanitary panels was given a notice for mere instagram posts well uh, look you there is a there is a very beautiful line you need not make any personal attributes to judges but as an institution you can always make objective criticism and nothing wrong about it i think i feel that i have a fundamental right to do it in fact i feel i have a duty to do it because i am if i am educated if i am a lawyer who is supposed to be part of administration of justice who is supposed to love rule of law then i would be failing in my duty if i were not to criticize the uh, supreme court time and again about their failures so long as personal motives are not attributed to the judges so i think uh, nothing wrong about you know taking them on we must take them on we must guide them and criticism 
I mean, even in many judgments of uh, under contempt of court act, Supreme Court has said that uh, there is an absolute right to criticize. Nobody can be stopped from criticizing judges. So I, I, I feel that we should not be really worried about contempt. And now contempt of court act has been amended to say that truth is a defense against contempt. So nothing wrong. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, so people have been, uh, people post often uh, wild things on Facebook like conspiracy theories, offensive ideas, bald faced lies. And a lot of times it's not with evidence. Okay, So however, it may be demeaning, polarizing or false. Now, is, should there be some kind of regulation there? Because this is not in the, is this in interest of free speech or how should it be regulated? Sir? What well, it is going to incite violence, certainly it must be stopped. And if President Trump can be stopped by Twitter and Facebook, then I think you and I can certainly be stopped. So I, I, okay. I think that uh, nobody has a right to, you know, hurt the sentiments of somebody else, uh, which will result in demeaning uh, some other persons or inviting, uh, you know, violence against them. That right is not there. Hatred is something which, you know, should, you can use it positively. Nothing wrong about, you know, social media is a beautiful uh, vehicle for transmitting your thoughts and your views and to create an atmosphere of love and respect, not to create an atmosphere of hatred. Uh, so I think uh, people must use it in a very, very positive way. You have a right to criticize, you have a right to say anything, but nothing, you know, which will generate hatred against uh, other person. Thank you, sir. So, uh, political prisoners uh, are charged with draconian laws such as Unlawful Activities Prevention Act and uh, they don't have much rights under that. So, their sentences also can be increased without provision of bail. What are your views on it, sir? To my mind, these laws are, you know, in, uh, in antiquity. I think I, our state, I sometimes wonder, is state so weak that it needs these laws to suppress the citizens? State is supposed to be strong. State is not a weak instrument or a creation that it is going to be afraid because, you know, somebody expresses uh, some views right or left, you know, which is, uh, it's not going to, uh, I think, uh, lead to destruction of the state. So I, I, I feel that these laws are uh, more often than not abused and it, it, they are not being abused today only. They were abused even in the past by the previous governments. So uh, these laws, you know, the, uh, the, the executive, the officers and the politicians would always like to somehow, you know, keep the uh, citizens under control, under check. The moment, they, as I said, you know, that uh, Professor Ketisha's statement is so beautiful that the moment, you know, somebody expresses disagreement, they will charge him with sedition. They will charge him with something else. They will bring all these UAPA Act and other nonsensical acts against them and keep them inside. But ultimately what happens? You are by putting people you know, in jail under these kind of draconian laws, you are only creating, generating a lifetime's hatred in the mind of that individual against the state. And that's not good because one of the most beautiful things about criminal uh, jurisprudence is that you must try and reform people. You are trying to reform people. If somebody has made a mistake, help him you know, correct that mistake. Don't do something which is going to really, you know, uh, create a permanent uh, enemy of the state. And this is where the state doesn't realize the kind of damage it is doing, uh, you know, by, uh, uh, by applying these laws. So one of the contrarian views is that, you know, uh, one person said that if you actually visit the UAE, South Korea or Gulf countries, then you will see how the freedom, then you will realize what the freedom of speech is. That is what the person is saying. Those are, but the answer, those are the answer to that is very simple. They yes. are not democracies. Hmm. And I'm certainly not proud of the Arab world. If my friend who is asking that question is proud of the Arab world, then he should go and settle down there. But no, democracy means freedom. And freedom means absolute freedom. So, you know, I mean, look at United States. How beautifully, look at Europe. How beautifully people are allowed to articulate their, you know, viewpoints against uh, anything and everything. So long as, you know, you don't cross the boundary of inciting violence or generating hatred. So, I mean, uh, nobody, I mean, our statements are not going to create a mutiny now in this country with 133 crore people, you know, at the most, maybe if I were to make a statement, 100 people will like it. 
but uh, 133 crore 99 lakh people are not going to like it so <laughs> I, these are all you know these are all gifts from the imperialism uh, the law of sedition etc they are not uh, uh, they are not proper instruments for a vibrant democracy that we proud ourselves to be so one more question thank you so much uh, there are a couple of people who asked about uh, the, your views on the kashmir issue that they're saying that you know these freedom uh, article 19 is really not applicable in kashmir to them in the practical sense of things that's what they have been saying so what are your views on it sir see my forget my views i'll tell you statistics in 2013 uh, just about 16 youth had joined militancy local youth had joined militancy in kashmir in 2020 191 youth have joined what does that tell you that tells you that the high handedness of the security forces is working far from correcting the situation now it's you know nobody i mean i am one of those who strongly believes that militancy must be fought and it must be wiped out i strongly believe in that but i do not believe that is in part of that exercise you can you know kill innocent people or arrest innocent people and you can leave absolute discretion to the security forces which is not supervised by any judiciary whatsoever that kind of a democracy i am not proud of and we have i mean we must face one thing that our neighboring countries are our enemies they will do anything and everything to ensure that this country is destabilized by taking the kind of harsh measures that we are taking in jammu and kashmir we are playing straight into their hands so instead of improving the situation i feel that we are really creating a permanent you know anarchy in that part of the country which is not good we we have to use you know we have to use both <coughs> soft measures and also harsh measures we can't just rule i mean <coughs> there is a there is a very beautiful statement uh, by uh, uh, which was uh, made by dr ambedkar and i will give this uh, as an answer to my young friend he read out this on uh, 17 december 1946 when the when president of the constituent assembly suddenly asked the dr ambedkar uh, why don't you say something about the draft resolution which pandit jawalal nehru has moved on for Uh, framing of constitution so he said i was unprepared i thought my turn will come tomorrow but i i still respond and one of the things that he said on that speech is quoting edmund burke which is brilliant he says uh, the uh, edmund burke was uh, you know trying to bring conciliation between the british people and the americans because the uh, british wanted to use force against the american colonies first sir and i'm quoting edmund burke first sir permit me to observe that use of force alone is but temporary use of force is alone is but temporary it may subdue for a moment but it does not remove the necessity of subduing again and a nation is not governed which is perpetually to be conquered so you know it's very important these these people were geniuses the every member of the constituent assembly was a genius sadly we will never find them again they knew what a nation building was they knew what nation creation was they knew what people's rights were they knew what governance was you can't govern with force and that's what is important that to look at irish problem for 100 years the british and the irish fought in northern ireland ultimately it had to be settled and today they are living very peacefully so you know it's it's very difficult choice i mean i i personally feel that by giving security forces a free hand we have uh, created more problems for us than solving this situation so uh, one more question sir uh, media is the fourth pillar of democracy but media trials have crossed the limits to hurt the sentiments as well as character the assassination of a person in this context what is your take on media trials that how can one actually effectively you know take action if there is a uh, it it looks like that there is a media trial happening 
So actually, well, media is both sides. <clears throat> they have a sting operation side also, and media trials also. So, so like, there is no doubt it? that media in this country and a substantial part of it is acting extremely responsibly. There is no doubt about it, and uh, they are responsible for inciting violence. They are responsible for inciting hatred against communities. They are responsible for uh, assassinating characters of individuals. Uh, media has done a great disservice. The power of media is being abused day in and day out, day in and day out. And this is where uh, we really uh, need to strike against them. Uh, the difficulty is that this section of media always acts uh, in support of the ruling party. So it may be BJP today. It may have been Congress yesterday. But these are, you know, these political parties use them to propagate their ideas, their ideology, and their, uh, you know, way of uh, life and uh, their agenda. <clears throat> it's not good. There are enough provisions under <coughs> various laws, including under the license conditions of these media, uh, you know, uh, whether electronic or print media, uh, uh, this thing where uh, government can you know proceed against them but the government doesn't want to proceed against them and uh, they can be penalized under those laws uh, those regulations uh, including uh, the uh, program code etc but uh, apparently uh, it suits the government of the day and so they will not uh, take any action against them but yes i must say that it is an extremely alarming situation that has developed in this country Thank you so much, sir. Sir, would you have time to take one last question? Sure. Okay, sir. Uh, how would we overcome situations? This question has come in again, uh, but uh, everybody is the last question, so we'll also need to head. We scheduled for one hour only. So, how would we overcome situations when a judge pre pre adjudicates certain matters based on a personal line of thought, deviating from procedures established by law? So I don't have more context, sir. The person has repeated the question a couple of times, so I thought I'll just ask. No, I think you know it is happening. I mean, judges have a, a serious predilection of their mind towards certain causes, and it is being reflected in their uh, uh, judgments, their uh, you know orders. And uh, what is really troublesome is that, uh, if, uh, as I see it in Supreme Court and some high courts also, that uh, the power of the chief justices. As uh, you know, as uh, uh, as uh, as uh, uh, for you know, framing the roster uh, and as uh, you know, constituting benches, uh, master of the roster, as they call it, that power has been seriously uh, abused by many chief justices, and uh, as a result, uh, it certain matters which you know the executive would want to be decided in a particular manner are you know, being assigned to certain benches. And it's been happening. I've written about it uh, many a times to the Chief Justice, uh, including uh, you know, in case of certain large corporate house. So I think these are all extremely serious situation. Uh, my own take is that judiciary is facing a grave crisis. And unless the judges, uh, and I, I must say one thing, that large number of judges, overwhelmingly large number of judges are good in judiciary. But they are silenced by this very powerful minority who are, you know, uh, who are perhaps acting at the behest of the government in one sense or the other. And uh, they are uh, this vast majority of good judges are unable to speak up or to really ensure that, uh, you know, uh, the balance is maintained within the judiciary and this, you know, perceived bias uh, in uh, judicial approach disappears. That's uh, it's it's from you know lowest to the highest level of judiciary, and that uh, that must uh, go. I think it would be in the great interest. It's a great institution, judiciary. It has a great responsibility, and it is the only institution which can keep a check both on legislature and the executive. It must do so as fiercely, independently as uh, it can. Let us pray together that uh, you know these good judges somehow uh, get together and do something about it. Uh, they, they met on that fateful day, uh, four judges of the Supreme Court and spoke about it. Uh, and I don't know whether uh, you know it or not, but on that very morning, my article had appeared in the Indian Express calling upon these good judges to act against Chief Justice Mishra. So they did come out, four of them, including Just Justice Gogoi then. But uh, we saw later what Chief Justice Gogoi ended up doing. 
So <laughs> I don't know what is in store for us, what is the future of judiciary, but I do hope and pray that it is a good future because I love judiciary. I am a judge's son. I have been a lawyer for 42 years and I respect judiciary a lot, but I still feel that it is my duty to point out the failures of the judiciary and uh, with the hope, fond hope, that judiciary will correct them. Thank you so much, sir. This was an excellent session. I learned a lot. I'm sure our participants also, they have been sending us a lot of, you know, uh, appreciation for the session and they've been really loving it. I'm keeping on getting those messages in chat. So thank you really so much, sir. It was thank amazing you very to much have to all you. Of you. Thank you, sir. And lots of good luck to you. Mm, become you so great, uh, great citizens. Thank you, sir. So we will close the session now. Thank you so much, sir, for your time. Thank you, everybody who attended the session. Uh, and stay tuned. We will keep bringing more webinars to you. Thank you. Bye, sir. Goodbye.